Let me get my printout here. All right. Okay, welcome uh, everyone and uh, approval of the advisory board of health minutes from July 1, 2021. Has, has everybody taken a look at those? Are we ready to vote? Okay, let's uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, none opposed, hearing none. The minutes have been approved. OK, today we've got a discussion of resolution and it's a health order resolution from the mayor's office and from our illustrious uh, director of the health department, Christina. And so um, at this point, uh, do we want to start with you, Christina, as far as the uh, introduction of this issue? Or you want to go ahead and we can do that. I know I shared it with all of you and I'd be happy to share it on the screen if any of you would prefer that. Okay. Give me just a second to pull it up. Okay. Are you guys all able to see my screen? Yes. yes. So we have drafted a resolution for Monday night's council meeting, which you might want will, to make it bigger. Well, I will try. Well, let's do this. Okay. Nope. Bottom right. Let's do. That may be way too big for you guys, but we'll start. Will that work? Uh, that looks better. Okay. I forgot that you guys, of course, are probably seeing much smaller screens. Um, so we have a resolution that will authorize the mayor and the health director to issue a public health order for a period of 30 days. This public health order is a mask mandate, which will uh, require masks indoors and outdoors at large community events. Um, the mayor is asking for you to review and to weigh in on whether you would support it. And then on Monday night, the council will vote on the resolution on whether to support the mayor issuing the public health order. It mirrors very closely previous public health orders that were issued. We, of course, uh, encourage everyone to limit exposure and avoid large groups and other crowds. Oh, hold on just a sec. We have some people waiting in the lobby. Let me let them in. Are you guys still able to see my screen? Yes. yes. Good. Um, there are exceptions, of course, uh, for children, it, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, persons who are eating or drinking. So, of course, restaurants, bars, um, if you're actively eating or drinking, we understand that it's impossible to do that with a mask on. Um, people who are obtaining a service for the nose or face where they have to remove it. So if you're getting your nose pierced, we are going to allow you to remove your mask in order to get your nose pierced. Or if you're going to the dentist and you need to remove your mask, of course, we understand that a mask is going to be removed indoors for those reasons. Um, we have made this exception before, and I know this is one that um, has been felt strongly in our community. Uh, persons who are engaging in faith services. Um, and those professional and student athletes that are engaged in high intensity organized gameplay. Um, we know that there's other precautions that are taken often and we, we want them to be able to play safely. Now I'm gonna open it up to you guys. I know there are other questions that were asked on Monday night, which we can also discuss, um, but I will open it up for your discussion on the resolution. Mr. Chairman, sir. Yes, sir. Jason. Um, I, um, a, I, I appreciate the the fact that the council has forwarded this to the the uh, Board of Health for consideration. Um, the uh, we've been meeting monthly to engage in the response to the pandemic, um, and we've been very fortunate, I think, to have several physicians uh, that have been very involved in. 
the data of the spread, the ebb and the flow. Uh, I think this is a reasonable and balanced approach. Um, I appreciate that that uh, it it allows recognition to that we want to uh, help our our local businesses such as restaurants and and, and bars that are were hurt uh, as as people avoided them. Uh, this looks like it should pretty well keep them intact. I was out the other day and stopped in at a sandwich shop that that uh, had already implemented it. And everybody wore a mask while we were standing stuck in line. And then we took them off while we ate and we put them back on. And there wasn't any anybody uncomfortable uncomfortable with that. Um, I would I would add I think that we're we're not certainly alone. We're not in front of the wave on this issue. Uh, other governmental jurisdictions around us, including all of the school districts that serve the, the children of independence. Have, have gone to this. Uh, so there's there's many people readapting to the discomfort of wearing a mask, and I don't think anybody appreciates it. I, I think it follows along with what we need to be doing as a city and a community and a nation to combat this. And I'm sort of hoping somebody smarter than me can show there's a, a great little vi uh, visual of, of Swiss cheese and how you go about stopping, you know, the pandemic. And, and it really helps uh, for people like me that are more visual and uh, to understand, you know, you've got to have multiple things if we're going to, as, as a community, because this isn't an individual thing. It isn't, it isn't Jason against the pandemic. It's everybody in town, everybody in the state, everybody in the country. And, 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 and I, I get it that it's difficult for some folks. I've got some friends that have difficulty, but we we go through that in, this in other venues. Uh, we don't allow personal choice to decide what speed you're going to go in on the road. Uh, I assume way back in the beginning, I'm not that old, uh, there were no speed limits uh, because they invented cars and there were other horses and the things didn't go fast. And then as they got going faster, somebody invented speed limits. It, we don't leave it up to personal responsibility or personal desires because it endangers others. And we've learned how to adapt. Um, when I was younger, I did have a heavier foot and I had people in blue outfits that would occasionally reprimand me for that. Um, but we we learn to adapt, and it's for the good of our broader community. And, and I and I hope the Midwest sense of 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 protecting each other and our neighbors and our families and working together for a common good will will overcome the discomfort that some of our our neighbors have with 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 the inconvenience of wearing a mask. I I also hope, and I'm looking forward to feedback from from Dr. Uh, Morris and Dr. Nelson that are deep into the the, the literature and the, the numbers and the data and the ebb and flow of that, uh, that I, you know, we're reacting because enough of us didn't get vaccinations four or five months ago, and we we let this thing come back. And had had enough of us rolled up our sleeves, we probably wouldn't be here today. Now, I'm a lay person, so I'm not sure I I can say that with any authority, but I'm interested to see whether that is a reasonable assumption. I'm I'm in support of this. I emailed to the other board members to the day of the day uh, an idea of a of a resolution we, we I would consider putting forward, saying we support it, and makes a few other comments such as, hey, we appreciate our city employees and we encourage the city administration to work with our city employees on how to make sure we're doing our most to keep them safe. Um, uh, Dr. Ruckman, I think, had a great idea a long time ago of is there a way we can help people by helping them know how to, how to properly wear and take care of their mask. I know my wife's reminding me all the time I need to wash it more often to get it. And, and if Wendy and need to make them double layered and those kinds of things, and maybe we can use Channel 7 to help help our, our neighbors better 
utilize uh, the, the 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 math. Um, so anyway, that's that's my comment for the evening. Um, so I, I'm I'm in support of of this proposal, and uh, I uh, I'm looking forward. And maybe and I apologize. Maybe the agenda ought to sort of get flipped because maybe the feedback on the general discussion we get from Dr. Morris and Dr. Nelson ought to be part of this discussion for the benefit of our guests and whatever council members are going to be watching them. They probably want to know the status of the pandemic in independence in the region, um, and, and that may benefit people before we actually have a vote on, on, on whether we're going to do this. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, I think that the there was, uh, I called up a few of the uh, council members and I don't know that they were uh, well aware of the issue right now where it stands. And so um, they may um, be um, kind of getting caught up here after we have a chance to talk about it today. And obviously the recording will be good so that they can go back and hear what was discussed. Um, Dr. Nelson, uh, maybe Jason has a point that we need to get you into the conversation early on here. So your, you and Dr. Uh, Morris, the, what you have to share, both can uh, be uh, part of the discussion. Yeah, happy to, Dr. Ruckman. Jason, appreciate your observations. I couldn't have summarized it better, to be honest. You alluded to the Swiss cheese slide. It was very well received for those of you that uh, may not be aware or may not have seen it. Uh, the chief medical officers across the city um, under Dr. Stites' leadership from the University of Kansas um, hosted a <clears throat> webinar this past Friday morning um, at the request of the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. <clears throat> we expected to have three or 400 attendees that had blown past 800 um, as we were trying to get the thing up and going. And, and the message that... Um, that we felt compelled to bring forward was similar, but somewhat different than last November when um, we went public. As all of you know, we try to be very careful um, to stay in our lane as it relates to our expertise, which is as clinicians who are engaged in the direct care in our institutions and careful to um, balance that with um, being um, cautious at times, probably overly so, we, we believe in leaning in as it relates to public policy and debates over mandates. We tried to just bring the message of the criticality of this decision forward, um, which the feedback we got generally was very positive. Uh, we spent a long time prepping and trying to pick the data and the information we used to make sure that it was objective and as scientific um, as it could be. And um, at the end of that um, presentation, I think the overall feedback was positive. There was the expected small uh, minority who uh, resisted or challenged uh, some of the evidence and the points we made. But I think what's different about this time is, is that um, our overall system is in a very different place uh, as it relates to our staffing and our capacity. When the very first of these waves hit last uh, spring, our hospitals emptied. People were fearful uh, to come, worried about getting COVID um, while they were in our institutions. And so we had just a plethora of beds and capacity available to us. And that persisted through the summer and to some degree even into the fall. Um, as we got into kind of the second wave in the late fall into the winter, we saw some capacity come back, um, or, or we still had capacity, but not quite as much as we did, but we were spared by the absence of any seasonal respiratory illnesses aside from the COVID activity, which is unprecedented in, in really any recent historical times. Respiratory syncytial virus in the pediatric population and influenza and other seasonal viruses were nearly absent in our community across the winter. So we got kind of another buy, if you will, during that um, second uh, wave. Um, as we started to see this third wave, I'll call it, or surge uh, start here, which um, as we look back at the data was 
in early to mid June. Um, we had uh, really busy hospitals all across the system, all across the city. Many believe in large part due to delayed care. The fact that ironically we were seeing resurgence of other viral and respiratory illnesses um, in a non-seasonal pattern. So uh, the Children's Hospital had seen respiratory syncytial virus and parainfluenza um, start to come back and causing respiratory illness um, as we got into the early summer, which is unusual and is believed in large part to be um, that we stood down on our masking and our distancing uh, from that perspective. So we had volumes that looked more like fall or winter based volumes with a delivery system that was suppressed mm -hmm. as far as its staffing. And that's the other very concerning issue for us right now. There are extreme to critical shortages uh, in many of the disciplines, but for sure, most pressingly in the bedside hospital nursing corps. And so we, we've got this scenario here, uh, really high volumes, unseasonal spikes in, in other illnesses in addition to this third surge of COVID and a gap in our staffing that is unlike any most of us in our, our long careers have seen. So our message last Friday was, we can do something now, which is to try to curb the immediate spread. And the best we know, not the perfect, but the best we know is to mask and to work on distancing and good hygienic practices. And in the, in the, in the near future, to try to re-energize the uh, interest and commitment to vaccination. And, and I would echo your comments, Jason, that many of us tried to message back in the spring that we were letting up too soon. I mean, we got to 35 or 40 or 42 percent and we were thinking, well, that's good progress. But we let a lot of other interests, um, I think, take center stage um, and not really uh, allow us to keep the keep the pressure on to move the vaccination rates higher. And as a result of that, we, we created an opportunity for the virus to continue to spread, mutate, and, and create variants. So now we're faced with a, a highly transmissible version, i.e. the Delta variant, uh, in the middle of all of those other constraints in our delivery system. I would say as a city, we're on the verge of moving from really high conventional operations into the next level, which is what we call contingent uh, operations, which is when you start to move past 100% staff capacity. And when that starts to happen, you have to make decisions about shuffling your resources um, from other areas of care in the hospital and move them uh, to bedside nursing care for the acutely ill. If it continues to push beyond that, then you get into uh, critical operations level, which is usually when you get one and a half to two times your capacity, which is not on the radar here currently, uh, but then gets to some of the unfortunate stories and, and, and scenarios that we've all seen play out in other markets um, who took worse hits than we've endured here so far uh, in our market from the pandemic. So um, I think it is different this time. I think it is what it is, but we've missed some opportunities in the past. And our belief is, is that there is something we can do here <clears throat> here and now, and we need to try to do it. We're trying to stay away from <clears throat> arguing some of the kind of on the skirts data about how imminently masking and distancing can be effective. The bottom line is it will have some impact <clears throat> and something is gonna be better than nothing because we're um, at a point now that we haven't accepted transfers at center point for almost two weeks and for the first time and anybody's history there, and Terry can probably reaffirm it, uh, we've been on um, time critical diagnosis closure, uh, which means that we've not even been able to accept heart attack strokes and at times traumas over the past week to 10 days. And I've never seen that personally in my career. Um, you almost always keep some capacity available um, to manage the critically ill who roll in. And obviously for those who still end up there, we do what we can. Um, but at this juncture, we're trying to 
kind of move that to anywhere else there's capacity in the city. Um, and then as that continues to shrink, then we're going to move into that contingency phase of healthcare delivery um, in, in probably the next few days to a week uh, in less than curb. In specific numbers, we just passed our all-time high um, from the previous surges yesterday at 46 inpatients. Um, research has been bouncing around. They got a little relief and got a number of discharges yesterday and got back down in the upper 30s. They've been as high as the 60s. And our Kansas City Metro HCA hospitals have been well north of 130, I think, 140 um, inpatients. Um, and all the other systems are reporting just that, that they're bumping up against or bypassing their COVID numbers previously, but it's in the context of all of this other downward pressure on our ability to care, which is very different from the previous surges. So it's a few minutes, but I thought it's a story that you probably all need to understand because folks will ask you as we lean in on this request um, about why it's necessary and what's different um, at this at this moment in time, so. Has there ever been um, a pandemic similar or con situation that was uh, like what we've experienced, but now we've got what um, the um, variants that has um, um, very infective, but it's not nearly as morbid. The morbidity isn't there uh, quite there. And so, but it's still affecting our systems to the point where it, you know, the, like you were saying, some of the other services and uh, needs go unmet. Yeah, I'm 35 years in and I haven't seen it to this level. We've had seasonal kind of endemics or, or smaller pandemics. You know, the last great one was in the early 1900s. And of course we were in a completely different place than as far as healthcare in general and certainly our public health abilities. But um, in recent times, I haven't seen this this kind of combination of challenges um, that we're faced with, but the transmissibility, and I think Dr. Morris follows it, some of the Arden values and all um, of just the difference in the current variant from uh, the early COVID viruses are, are dramatic and unsettling about how quickly it's morphed. And I have to tell you, the average age of the hospitalized patient is plummeting. Um, it was in the 60s a few weeks ago. I haven't calculated ours this week, but I would guess it's in the 50s. Uh, we've had mortalities in the 40s uh, years old group, and I've heard of even younger um, across our system. We've had um, pregnant moms deliver infants that are positive. We've had an infant death, um, and there was a maternal death at one of our sister hospitals yesterday. So this is a this is a really unsettling reality check um, for all of us um, who are trying to deliver care. And, and the only other, I guess, editorial comment I would make that I think is going to be important for our leaders to hear is that one of the most profoundly disenfranchising um, situations I'm seeing happen and that the folks working in our institution are saying is they're exhausted from the actual care. And then when they do get away from the hospital to try to continue to have to debate or respond to just this variety of challenges to the basic epidemiologic principles that we're all trying to stand by. We feel like we're trying to argue almost with folks that we need to do some of these things and that while you may believe otherwise, you're going to end up at one of our places and trying to get in when it doesn't work out for you or your loved one. And I'm worried there'll be no room in the end shortly. And if we don't all take that community responsibility, as Jason alluded to, we will as a community suffer even greater because it won't just be the COVID patients that are not going to be able to get access um, to care here in the very near future. I mean, our leaders have all had to make decisions in just the past few days about these transfer situations that we find ourselves in. And it is, it is a very sad and unsettling situation for each of us to find ourselves in. So this is very real and we need to, 
need to shift this mantra and have people be more respectful about trying to help us um, help our communities. And I'm really worried you all about being able to have a sustainable workforce here. I mean, people are really, really uh, burning out quickly across all sorts of disciplines and in all different places in their, in their clinical careers. And uh, so, so anything we can do, I am fully and 100% in support of um, as it relates to emphasizing the importance of making some of these um, decisions and making them as, as emphatically as we can. Any thoughts in response to Dr. Nelson's uh, comments? Dr. Nelson, I know that our council had the question on Monday night about the number of ICU beds that are COVID patients. I know you shared that you had 46 inpatients with COVID. They're curious about how many of those are taking up the ICU beds or if you can give an idea of the percentage, even if you don't have numbers. Yeah, actually, I left my numbers at the hospital, but the numbers I presented um, the other day uh, on Friday, uh, at that time, I think we had we had we had forecasted 38 or 40 or so at center point alone. Um, and I believe it on that particular day in the six HCA hospitals, our number was in the 140s for all in COVID patients. And of those, 46 were in the intensive care unit. Uh, and of those, um, it, I believe it was 16 or 17. No, I think it was 17 percent. But I'll get the numbers if we need them. But it was similar across most of the health systems. So um, there was a tiering of total patients, ICU patients, and then patients ventilated. And then we're also starting to track those who are on high flow oxygen therapies, which I think some of you probably are aware, we are trying very hard to maximize because um, prognostically it is not good once we put a COVID patient on the ventilator. So unlike in the early surge where we were ventilating earlier, we're not. So we think it's an important tale to also talk about the non-ventilated but high oxygen requiring population. Um, but I would say it's somewhere uh, probably across the various systems between um, 10 and 15 percent. What um, in terms of when you're doing diagnostic uh, evaluations, are you testing for the uh, the uh, deviant um, um, virus that uh, is taken and uh, made this all so much more of a problem? Or are you just doing the COVID-19 as the uh, primary, um, you're not necessarily de de defining between the two, are you yet? Yeah, no, so so our testing capabilities, both at Centerpoint and at our tertiary centralized lab, which for all of our hospitals in Kansas City is based at Research Medical Center, are all just for the presence or the absence of the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-19. Um, the public health department, the state health department, direct what specimens get sent on to Jefferson City or a reference lab to be typed. And typically they do that on some sort of a periodic basis based on epidemiologic principles. And then they just publish uh, reports about the overall Delta strain variant. But it, it's essentially in the, at least in the mid 90s, if not nearly 100% of the isolates, they're subtesting uh, from our area that are that are Delta variants. So it, it is, it is nearly 100% of uh, the current activity and the uh, in the subtyping that's being done by the state health department for our area for Delta. Wow, that's really taken over rather quickly. I. That's some un unbelievable. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't believe I you. That's another reason for call to action. I mean, it suggests the rate at which um, this continues to just get away with us with all due respect, or get away from us with all due respect, because we, we just didn't adequately check it and, um, 
and you know there's some reports of subsequent strains now um, that have been identified i've not followed those closely yet to know but um, this is really a story of delta variant in our area and we feel like our trend numbers are following to some degree what we saw with our fellow citizens down in springfield recently they're starting to see some relief but uh, our numbers are clearly moving the other way we did our a data graph update this morning and I mean it's it's nearly a straight up vertical line over the past two and a half to three weeks as far as day over day increases in positivity. Dr. Nelson, uh, so, uh, we've, we've got a, a good group of guests. I mean usually we're sort of a boring subcommittee and, and Christina <laughs> says there's some council members that are going to be reviewing this video. Might you speak to what happens when you're clo you're on high volume or your yeah. TCP, your trauma, STEMI, or stroke sections are closed, where, because I'm in that age group expecting my heart attack someday, uh, where yeah. do they go? Where do they end up uh, if we can't take care of them here in our community? Sure, yeah. The, the TCD statutes came out a little over a decade ago in Missouri, and, and they clearly define the expectations for the time critical diagnosis and, and what EMS is supposed to do in their response when they're on scene of a potential uh, time critical diagnosis. And really what it did was it, it changed the way in which there historically was a lot of rerouting um, for a variety of reasons of ambulance traffic. And it mandated that the most appropriate facility in proximity is where um, patients with suspected time critical diagnosis need to go. So we rarely, like I said, um, go on diversion for time critical. We go on transfer diversion on some periodic basis, but time critical is incredibly rare. So what happens is, is that you declare that you don't have any resources or capacity available, EMS and routes to the next nearest appropriate facility. Um, and then if there are none, then basically when everybody in a particular region is on high volume, um, then nobody is. So then the state um, basically negates um, your status and um, then ambulance traffic continues to come to your facility, just as walk-in traffic does as well. So we do what we do in healthcare, right? We, we take care of them. Um, but unfortunately, oftentimes that care is substantially um, or potentially substantially delayed just from the sheer volume that we're dealing with. I mean, our emergency room um, as we speak is, I didn't check the count when I left, but we've been holding anywhere between 20 and 30 uh, waiting for beds upstairs, which means we overflow out into the hall and other overflow space as well. So. So basically, it, it diverts that traffic um, to whatever other facilities have some capacity. And once nobody does, then everybody's open, and then the and then the volume continues to come back to your your facility. Thank you. Uh huh. Um. Dr. Morris, you want to maybe uh, give Dr. Nelson a chance to catch his breath and uh... <laughs> have, have another another cup of decaf. Uh, yeah, basically everything I had to say pretty much was echoing what he had to say. Uh, I did see one of my doctors at KU yesterday hoping he was not going to tell me I needed a bypass because I knew there was no vent to put me on after my bypass at KU. Uh, I think that the uh, uh, problem that hospitals are having with their diversions are astronomical. Uh, it's, you know, when your ER is full of trauma patients or whatever, and you have a hand units heading your way and you have no staff and you have no place to put them, it's nice to know, well, they're just going to take me to Lee Summit or they're going to take me over to research. but when everybody's in that situation, they just find another place to put you in the hallway. And it's 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 not the kind of health care that Dr. Nelson or I nor any doctor ever wants to uh, 
participate in. Uh, I, I think another important factor that, that wasn't mentioned, and, and actually let me preface this to say, I hope and pray that everyone had the opportunity to watch the uh, webinar last Friday from the Chief Medical Officers. Uh, if you haven't, you need to do it. If you don't have the link, Christina or I or Ralph or any of us would be happy to send it to you. I send it to every pastor I know and every business leader that I know and ask them and all of the school board members that I know and those that I don't know, asking them to review it because it scared me to death and I've been in this business 40 plus years. Uh, I've never seen a situation like we're facing in Kansas City right now. So it's information that we need to know because it's easy to dismiss the nightly news or whatever news channel it is you watch and yeah, 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 it's horrible, it's horrible. But I mean, this was the chief medical officers, the, the doctor in that hospital that kind of makes sure everything runs as smoothly as it possibly can that are saying we don't know what to do. Uh, uh, Dr. Nelson nor I have ever seen the debarkation of healthcare personnel that we have now. Uh, in the last two years, there have been a record number of physicians who left practice. They either retired or they're selling real estate or they're doing something because they can't do it anymore. Uh, the same thing is true with nursing. Uh, nursing schools, and I, I was hoping John might be here, uh, nursing schools are having trouble recruiting nurses. Now, granted, that's not going to impact us because it takes a lot of years to train a nurse but we're having nurses leave the profession in droves. We're having nurses that are being recruited by agencies that pay them a bonus to work for them. So they're leaving our local hospitals and are going to Texas or Florida and working in those situations, making twice the wages, perhaps what they're making here. Uh, so uh, somebody, uh, I think it was at the MACG meeting yesterday, said you have the three S's, you know, you have uh, uh, space and you have uh, staff and you have stuff. And they have plenty of stuff. We're okay with uh, PPE and things that we were missing before, but we don't have the first two S's. You know, we don't have space and we certainly don't have staff. And almost every hospital is experiencing significant problems with staffing issues. Uh, the other thing that was very frightening for me on that, and particularly my pastor friends that I sent it to, was the information from Children's Mercy, because the previous variants of, of COVID that we had uh, did not affect children. Uh, and you just didn't see kids. I mean, you might have 25 kids in your practice this week that tested positive for COVID. None of, I mean, they all thought they had a cold, and that's sort of kind of what they had. But uh, there have been a number of days in recent weeks that Children's Mercy ICU has been full. And it's been about 50% RSV or syncytial virus and about 50% COVID. And they've had deaths that they didn't have before. Uh, in Texas, where I had a number of friends that grew up there, uh, they're sending children by helicopter uh, to other states or other hospitals in the state to try to find a ventilator to put those babies on. Um, and uh, it, it's it's a new and different sort of issue that we're, we're dealing with. Um, something that nobody's brought up that will probably be brought up uh, is the concept of herd immunity. Because as we're nearing, we're not at 50% yet, but as we get closer to herd immunity, it's like, well, we're going to get there because we've got all these people who got COVID, and so they're immune. And we've got all these people getting vaccines, so they're going to be immune. And I sat down and tried to crunch those numbers Monday, and I spent about two and a half hours doing it and couldn't come up with a number. Because all those people that had COVID, the vast majority of them are also in the ones that we count as being immunized. So you kind of have to take that percentage, if you have 25% of the population that had COVID, well, they're also 25% of the population that got immunized. So it's just a profoundly complex calculation to do, and we're not anywhere close to having herd immunity, and we don't know what herd immunity is going to be. 
Uh, if can I share my screen, Christina, real quick? Promise I won't take very long. You should be able to. Can you see me? No. Well, we can see you, but we can't see your screen yet. Hmm. Oh, that's right. I got I got to punch the share my screen button, don't I? And that's the one that I want to show. How about now? Perfect. It is okay. coming up. It's still a black screen. And there you go. There it you is. See your mark presentation. Yeah, okay. So this is just yesterday's data from from Mark for the region. Uh, and when I'm showing things locally, a lot of times I show the Eastern Jackson County numbers, but I think the overall numbers are pretty much echoed. Uh, if you look over here on the right hand side, you see that on Tuesday with 25 of the 27 area hospitals reporting, they had 185 new hospitalizations. Well, if you take that number and come back over here, uh, we're in where we were in December and November. Uh, so this is not what you want to see here. Uh, and it's a number that almost always is going up. On average, we're putting 150 people in a hospital per day. Uh, and this is the new cases. And I don't always look at new cases because we're not testing everybody. Uh, but I like the slide because I plugged in here when we lifted the mask order, and this was Independence, this is not all of Kansas City, but this is about where it has an Dr. Morris, it hasn't advanced yet to your your next slide. It didn't show it. It's showing hospitalization still. Uh, or at least it is on my screen. OK, well, let me go back. Tell you what, we'll there we go. It. Now we're on cases. There may just we'll be just a delay. It. There you go. We'll just show it small. This is where we lifted the mask order. This is where the Delta variant showed up. And this is what's happened since that time. And the important thing to understand about the Delta variant is it's almost like a different virus. Uh, I think Dr. Ruckman said something about the infectivity of it. There was a slide in, I think it was in the chief medical officer's presentation, well, I know it was, that it kind of looked like the infectiousness of something you don't want to have, we usually compare to measles. Because if you walk into the arena to watch a uh, Mavericks game and somebody in there has the measles and you're not immune, you're going to go home with the measles. That's how infectious it is. It's one of the most infectious viruses that we've ever had. And the Delta isn't quite there, but it's approaching that. And it's certainly closer to measles than what the original uh, COVID back, uh, virus was. And so we're dealing with an organism that's much more infectious than what we started off with. Um, and we have to look at that as a reality and deal with it. Um, somebody mentioned the, the third spike that we had, and I, I like to point out that if you look back 100 years at the last pandemic we had, which was the Spanish flu, which actually didn't come from Spain, it came from Kansas. But anyway, the Spanish flu, more people died from the third wave than from the first two waves. That's not likely going to happen with the Delta variant because 90% of the people that are most likely to die, old people like me, uh, have been immunized. At least that we're trying to head that direction. So anyway, that's just kind of an interesting uh, slide. Um, the other slide that we've kind of commented on is this Swiss cheese slide. I've uh, fallen in love with Dr. McKay. He's a uh, Australian uh, virologist uh, and kind of invented an early part of this slide. But the nice thing about this slide is that none of these slices of Swiss cheese will keep you from getting from the virus. You know, if you got the vaccine, there's still holes there. It's not perfect. If you uh, do ventilation changes and outdoors and air filtration, it's got holes in it. If you wear a mask, there's people who don't wear their mask right. Uh, and there are personal responsibilities like wearing a mask and staying home if you are sick. Somebody, and I don't remember what meeting it was in, 
commented on what percentage of the people that were in their hospital with COVID had been to work the day before. And it was something like 80% of people the day before they thought they were going to die, so they went to the hospital, were at work. And there's lots of reasons people go to work when they're sick, and that's kind of complex. But all there's personal responsibilities and there's shared responsibilities. And so um, I think part of the city's role is to uh, help with shared responsibilities. We certainly are doing vaccines. We're certainly doing a case follow up and trying to uh, find people that have been exposed and get them tested so that they don't spread the disease any farther. We're working on testing uh, uh, services. And then personal responsibilities, I think it's the city's role to encourage people to do that. Uh, so we need to explain to them why masks may not only save them from being, getting sick, but save everybody that they ran into at work from getting sick or the people that uh, stood behind them at line at Ivy trying to get checked out from getting sick. And so I think we can share this information with people that no, this particular thing isn't going to cure it. It isn't going to necessarily prevent it 100% of the time, but when you put all of these things together, uh, there's hope that it will it will help. Um, is there going to be an opportunity for guests to speak at the end of the meeting, or is this just for us to sit and observe? Um, I really, um, don't see any reason why we shouldn't have a good question presented if we've got a guest that's got something that you would like to share or ask. I was, I was just wondering, my name's Colleen Huff and I have a son who's going to be a senior at William Christman and I'm very involved in the community and I was just wondering when people are testing positive for COVID, are they getting the opportunity for early, like pre, you know, just some of the early treatments that are supposed to be helpful to prevent them from ending up in the hospital? I'm not a practicing physician. Uh, I, I am familiar with that data, unfortunately. There's nothing that currently is widespread that has stood the test of analysis uh, that's being offered by most physicians. Yeah, because uh, that's, I mean, that's like if I would contract the virus, I definitely want a doctor who's going to be able to give me early treatment versus just okay, well, we'll just see what happens and see if you end up in the hospital. And um, it just seems like if the doctors were doing that, we wouldn't be in a position where we're short of hospital beds. And so did you say Center Point is completely full right now and there's no uh, ICU beds available? Is that what I heard you say? Yes, ma'am. That was our status as of earlier today. This is Dr. Nelson. I'm the chief medical officer there. So uh, we have uh, 28 ICU beds and we had 28 patients in those beds and we're um, really tied on our staffing to cover those 28 patients. They're not staffed at the level we would normally prefer to have them staffed at. And then we have additional patients. I don't have the breakdown of what types of beds they're waiting on, but we have patients waiting um, in the ER who were, were, were managing care to the best of our ability uh, in various areas in the emergency room until beds open up upstairs. Um, so, so it sounds staff. like it's a staffing issue versus like a COVID issue. It sounds like it it is more to do with staffing. Is that correct? Is that what I hear you saying? Um, it's a combination. Right now it's primarily staffing, but with some of the surges we've seen, uh, very close to physically beds up on the floor at times. Uh, I think our census today was not that, so we have some beds, um, but we're beyond our ability um, to staff them currently. But 
Uh, many of the hospitals reported last week that they're on the verge of even being beyond, uh, you know, full bed availability, less staff bed availability. So I think that's why the sensitivity about this message that we're um, trying to get out uh, so abruptly. And in answer to your question, we do have in our health system a couple of infusion centers um, in which we refer patients if they present with symptoms that don't meet um, criteria or need for admission um, to go and get uh, some of the, the pre-infusion the infusion therapies to try to help. As you heard reference, that the data is not super solid on that, but as you asserted, uh, you know, at this point, or anything we can do to try to minimize risk, um, you know, we're working at doing so. So we've tried to expand the availability of those infusion clinics. That said, uh, we have to shift nurses from our inpatient setting uh, to do those infusions. And so uh, we get into this kind of where can we shift staff in and around to to try to help us um, with this kind of macro problem we're dealing with. Dealing with, dealing with, dealing with. Okay, well, in, in one other suggestion, just because I'm a business owner, what about uh, staffing agencies that have nursing, you know, nurses available that uh, maybe you can, you know, p get some nurses and, you know, other health professionals that would be willing to, you know, work at Center Point. I mean, we yeah, use so, St. Luke's primarily, but I mean, I know that there are professional staffing agencies that have, you know, degreed uh, BSNs and, you know, other types of, you know, PAs and other types of professionals that would be willing to help out. Uh, believe me, ma'am, every, every hospital system in this town that I'm aware of has premium offers out to staff who will work directly for us and are probably indirectly in the midst of uh, bidding wars uh, for all of the agency-based nursing, uh, but so is everywhere in the country where there's staffing shortages. So uh, we find ourselves competing uh, for folks who are taking travel jobs in all sorts of different places, some trying to get away from the hot areas of COVID, others going into hotter areas. Um, and so um, th those tactics and all sorts of incentives to try to lure people back who have left the industry, as you heard, um, have been in place actually through uh, the past several months, not even just recently, because we started to see this uh, trend happening um, where our volumes were not letting up through the summer months of non-COVID patients. And as a result of that, knowing that we were going to be faced with this challenge, we weren't, um, you know, hoping that it was going to get to this extreme, but um, it is currently. But um, there are certainly all of those uh, strategies and tactics in place. I would suggest I know about HCA, but I, I hear my other colleagues talking on the CMO calls uh, faced with the same situation and utilizing every access to resources we can find. Yeah, I'm just trying to offer solutions. So I sure. I appreciate you allowing me to, you know, ask some questions because I I mean I have a niece that's a PA and then another one with her BSN. So I'm just trying to think of helpful strategies to navigate through this. So you bet. I, this, this is Dr. Morrison. Oh. I, I think it's important and, and something that oftentimes the public doesn't quite understand is that most of these roles are not interchangeable. Um, I was a gynecologist and you do not want me doing your cardiac bypass operation. I know how to do it. I've seen videos. I've watched it on YouTube. Uh, you can't take one type of role in the hospital and move them to another role in the hospital because they just don't have that training. It, it's like uh, a nurse on the obstetric unit may be a really, really great nurse, but she may not fit the role in the cardiac care unit just because they've been doing one role for a long time. And that's one of the huge issues that the hospitals are having is uh, you just cannot find somebody to fit the role that is that is needed at that time. Um, 
and you can't make them. It's just you can't train them fast enough. Yeah, that. Hello, this is <clears throat> Go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Laura Dominic. I didn't realize this meeting was open for public comment, but I'll keep it short. I'm a former paramedic and I know there are strike teams in Kansas City, ambulance strike teams in Kansas City and in Springfield right now because they're doing nothing but transferring patients to other hospitals because our Kansas City hospitals are getting overrun. And when I know Jason and I worked together when I was a paramedic, I never have even heard of such a thing as a strike team for an ambulance service like that and have never thought how badly it is that times critical uh, incidences, strokes, heart attacks, major trauma, all those things are having to be diverted away from our city. And we're just talking about our city. I suspect that is virtually everywhere in the city. And you are straining the system, the EMS system, as much as you are straining the hospitals, because the longer you have to sit and wait for that patient to get off of your bed, your stretcher onto a bed, means they're sitting around at the hospitals and are not able to handle the next call. So I'd like to also think that we're also considering the stress and strain on our EMS systems as well. Thank you. Yeah, EMS. Dr. Nelson, I appreciate your comments. Uh, we had our EMS partners at the hospital literally just yesterday um, debriefing. Uh, we got word of the governor's announcement. My understanding is, is that those are uh, six units in each of the three um, uh, geographic regions of St. Louis, Kansas City, and Springfield. Um, and as you alluded to, the dilemma is, is where do you take them? Um, nobody essentially has accepted transfers intra-facility uh, for a good period of time. And uh, the reality kind of struck me when I heard Dr. Seitz speak that the University of Kansas wasn't accepting. I mean, that's just, again, you know, people are tired of Dr. Nelson using the word unprecedented, but just unprecedented in my uh, many years here and so you're right and then wall times are just getting terrible when the when the units do arrive at our facilities because you can hardly get the you know the stretchers down the hall because we've got folks bedded um, in the halls let alone be able to give report I mean we do our best to expedite that so we can get them back in the field but we're running out of places for them to return subsequently um, to your point so um, it, it's absolutely a at just astonishing levels uh, for most of us as we we try to work each day through this. But um, yeah, it was it was interesting, and and I was worried about if those strike teams were going to be able to be of benefit because I thought if they can only move regionally, but I'm told there's no limitation on how far uh, they can go. Um, I heard another unsettling statistic today. I heard there were just four ICU beds left in the state of Arkansas um, as of a noon report today. So. Um, just how far out there's going to be access to move patients, um, I think, remains a question or for how much longer. Um, and, and we haven't been sending any out. We just haven't been able to been taking any in, at least at our place and in independence. So. Mr. Chairman, might I? Um, I, I think the, the discussion is excellent and the, the conversation uh, is excellent, but um or process uh so i guess you'd expect me to, to push process here but i would i would propose that i I've drafted a little resolution that i would like to put forward endorsing uh what has been presented to us um but i also wanted to tag on some additional sort of thoughts so i've emailed that to to the to the board but i know some are on phones and i, I know we have guests so if you would indulge me, I'll read it. It's very short. Uh, I'm proposing that the Board of Health appreciates the opportunity to review and comment on the draft material regarding a possible health order regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. The Board of Health supports the proposal. The Board of Health recognizes that the essential aspects necessary to control the pandemic are vaccinations, masks, social distancing, hand washing, in recognition of the illness. The Board of Health is aware of the per role of, the, of personnel, personal responsibility, 
necessary to respond to the pandemic, but just as important is the necessity of the community to work together for the protection of our friends, neighbors, and family. And just as speed limits are needed for traffic safety by the traveling public, the use of masks is a necessary response to the pandemic. The Board of Health compliments the city staff and volunteers who provided the community hours of time to provide community vaccination programs, testing, vaccination at various entities, and for the homebound. These efforts have helped make our community safer. The Board of Health recognizes that the city government has a responsibility to the citizens as well as to the employees of the city. The Board of Health encourages the city administration to work with the city employees to maximize the opportunity for vaccination, testing, and employee health during this difficult period in our nation. The Board of Health requests that the city make available on Channel 7 an instructional video to help citizens know how to properly wear, clean, and care for masks. I kept that short, at least for me. I would make a re resolution. Uh, I would ask that the body support that resolution, which is indicating our support for the material that's been presented for a review. So is that an official motion uh, that we need to get a second, uh, Jason? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, who would like to second that motion? I'll second the motion. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Well, hearing none, um, I think we're ready to, would, would you agree that you're all ready to vote? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All in favor, um, Christine, could you go ahead and take a roll call? I can. Dr. Ruckman? Yes. Dr. Morris? Yes. Jason White? Yes. Dr. Ruddy? Yes. Lori Halsey? She's not present. Dr. Nelson? Yes. Dr. Wingert? Yes. Dr. Muehlman. Yes. And Dr. Potts. Now present. OK. The motion passes, sir. OK. Um, any other questions or comments that anyone would like to make before we bring this meeting to a close? OK, if I hear hearing none, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Be Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming late. I mean, um, <laughs> at this late notice, we appreciate everybody's contribution. Thank you.